Um, so my name is Mozart Gelye. I'm the executive director of 21 Progress. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to be here and spending your valuable uh, time with me. I used to work in city and county, and I've also worked in the federal government, um, and I know how busy you folks are, um, and so you folks spending your time with us, it just means so much. Um, especially all the things you have to get done. Um, um, and so um, I'd like to start, you know, really I think um, where a lot of us really started to want to be in this room, right, which is November 9th of 2016. And the night before, you know, um, um, 21 Progress was founded by UFCW 21, and not just UFCW 21, they were founding members, but we were also founded um, by currently Congresswoman um, Pramila Jayapal and a number of other um, economic justice and social justice leaders in the community who kind of recognized that there was a gap. How do we actually bridge the gap of all the amazing work that's been done um, over so many years um, in this region with folks deciding to retire and the leadership gap, right? And how do we kind of make sure that the next generation of folks get the support, the skills, and the opportunity to take action in their own community, right? So that, we don't, so that this just doesn't end right here, but that we can kind of continue to see this region progress and prosper, right? Um, and so um, I say that because I was invited to an election party um, for the folks who helped pass the statewide minimum wage. It got passed, so that was for sure a highlight. Um, and I kept staying there and sitting there, um, looking at the results and definitely thinking that, you know, we were being punked, right? That like, you know, the scorecard was wrong and like the math was inaccurate and that somehow, some way around 1 a.m., they'd be like, okay, we've kind of figured it all out and it looks like someone's counting wrong, right? We got the wrong person in the room. Um, and so the next morning, um, and why that's important to me, at least to start there, is the next morning, half of my staff has varying levels of status and almost all of us have people in our families who are undocumented or who have have had a criminal experience and so based on the criminalized experience and so based on the political rhetoric of you know the political campaign in 2016 a lot of folks that had to show up to work at 9 a.m. you know I was kind of wary right I'm a concerned director of an organization and so I sent them all an email and I said you know folks look if it's hard it's hard I know this is very emotional please don't show up show up when you want to you know because because I know it's traumatic for a lot of folks in your families particularly for perhaps your parents or uncles or aunts um, who might be impacted by, you know, this, this sea change um, politically. And so I said that and um, fully expecting, you know, people would say, thank you, you're so amazing. And, you know, at 10 a.m. I'd be sitting in the office alone, ready to work for my team, right? Um, but that same morning, the reason why I couldn't, I didn't know who actually was there was it was actually Heroes Day at um, my children's middle school. And so as a father, I had to show up to breakfast at 9 a.m. and wear a face mask, you know, um, you know, being a hero with a 150 kids in Renton, uh, Washington, um, of varying ages, of vary, varying ages, varying faiths, varying colors and races, um, folks who had hijabs on and folks who were Sikh and folks who were Latino and Latina and folks who were Native and, and all those types of things. And I just thought to myself, right, there's no better place um, I'd want to be. And then the other thing I thought was, is that they're not talking about this at all. And that actually gave me a great deal of hope um, that, you know, if there can actually be a hero day after a day like that in a very diverse middle school where most of the people who live there are working class, we might have a chance. And so I get to my office at 10 a.m. and fully expecting for the folks I know who are directly impacted by the rhetoric of, of, of the politics of the day, that no one will be there. And actually everyone is there. And they're all sitting in a circle talking about what happened to them, what happened to all of us. And, and, and I asked one of my you know, managers, you know, who is for sure is directly impacted, you know, why did you come in? You know, like, you know, you have the privilege of working in an organization that works on immigrant rights, that works on social justice. What was the reason you decided personally to show up to work, right? You have choices. Um, and she told me that, you know, her parents who are undocumented had already left for work at 5 a.m. Right? And so, th so they were already driving to the other side of town and they didn't have choices, right? Because if they didn't show up to work that day, you know, they get fired, you know? And then, and then the boss starts to question, you know, why did you miss work on November 9th? Because you still have to work at the restaurant. You still have to serve food. You still have to do the labor that many of us oftentimes take for granted, you know? And so she said, if I have the choice to kind of 
show up to work and fight for social justice, and my parents still have to wake up at 5 a.m., then we've got a lot of work to do. You know, and, and I think kind of the contrast of the hero day at the middle school and then kind of hearing that many of the undocumented folks and many of the folk Muslim brothers and sisters and many of the folks who've been targeted, they still showed up to work the next day because many of those folks are both working class and also at our software companies, right, that create the assets that we all enjoy. And so they still have to show up for work, right, because Facebook still has to work and we still want to eat at the restaurant and you're still hungry, right, the day after. Um, and that was, I think, for me, kind of what the last few months has been like in terms of kind of wrestling with the folks most impacting also having to do all the labor. Right? And kind of connecting the dots from May Day and m immigration and how it actually works in our country. That at the end of the day, the people who we're talking about tonight don't get a chance to get the day off. Right? You can't call in sick when you work at a restaurant and you don't have paid time off and when you don't have paid sick leave. Which is actually exciting you know, when you kind of think about all the things we've done in this region to protect workers' rights and what we still need to do to make sure that human dignity at work is a fundamental element of any social policy that we create. Um, and so 21 Progress, you know, what we've done over the last um, few months um, has deep, been deeply rooted in coalition and kind of seeing these folks every three days that are on this panel with me at press conferences and coalition meetings and tables and things like that, kind of coordinating in ways we've actually never coordinated together before, to just be quite honest, you know? It's, it's caused us to kind of leverage all the resources, you know, we kind of singularly had and say, we're all in this together. Because the executive orders that were passed actually don't make sense. And so based on kind of logic, anyone can be targeted. Like that's actually the reading of the executive orders, that if they perceive, if a law enforcement official, anyone, even you know, someone at the mall, <laughs> perceives someone to be an immigrant, that they can actually report that as criminal, right? They can report that as cause for someone to be separated from their family, to be separated from their schools, to be separated from the people they love. That there is actually not due process. And I, I remember we were in a room with the, 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 the council for, um, city of Seattle, one of the lawyers, I was just like, what do you mean? Like, are you serious? Like, are you sure? He's just like, no, I'm going to, no, really, like, the executive orders created are actually created in ways that are inherently biased and are not concrete, rational, or logical, right? That they're not actually rooted in evidence, right? They're not rooted in due process. They're not rooted in democracy, you know? And so, and so I say that because I think us coming together was really this awareness that the rules of the game had changed. That, that, the game, that the rules that we oftentimes had, that if we did the right thing, that everything would work out, that if we kept showing up to work, everything would work out, had suddenly gone away, right? That the, that the you know, carpet had been pulled from underneath us, you know? Um, and so with that being said, we quickly got into coalition with a lot of dear friends here and started to create events that were very, very inspiring. My favorite one, for sure, was one where Anila hosts um, a uh, testimony right after the Muslim ban um, and also the immigration executive order where we brought together folks who were directly impacted by you know, these orders. And so Somali folks and Muslim folks and undocumented folks um, and a few politicians, but the politicians weren't kind of the point of the event. It was actually the people who were directly impacted, the Syrian families. And they got to share in their own words what it felt like to be targeted in such a way. And, and then the media was there and they started to craft stories, right, that actually humanized the lived experience of these, these folks who were directly impacted by these acts so that it wasn't just blurbs and it wasn't just, you know, people overgeneralizing and think, you know, API folks, that there's no API immigrants, which I'm sure, you know what I mean, or there's no South Asian immigrants, you know what I mean? And so we've been doing a lot of that work because I think a lot of times when we think about these issues, we oftentimes think of Latino, right? Like there's only Latino immigrants on the planet. It's only the country of Mexico, right? When actually everyone on the planet migrates everywhere and it's only here <laughs> where we have deep and robust problems around migration in ways that you don't see across the globe. And I think it's important for us to just kind of acknowledge that there's over 200 countries on the planet and most of them have better migration policies than us in terms of logic and reason. That if they say everyone's out, that they actually say everyone's out. If they say everyone's in, they actually mean everyone's in. And I say that because I think sometimes you say, but what about that country? What about this country? But they actually follow their own laws. 
but we don't, right? <laughs> like we don't actually follow our own laws on paper. Um, and I think that's important to say in government spaces, right? Because when we kind of read the, 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 the language that we actually wrote down on paper, um, we actually realize that we're not following the law as it relates to certain people. But we follow it robustly when it relates to other people. But when you point to dictarian countries or countries that are authoritarian, they're very concrete, right? <laughs> they, they make very specific and concrete decisions. But I think in a diverse country like ours, we still haven't figured out what we actually believe is fact, what we actually believe is law. Um, and so at 21 Progress, kind of getting out of the theoretical realm, what we've actually done is when we go into school settings, we've actually had conversations with principals and school district officials because we focus on K-12 and higher education and say, you say you value diversity, then why are all the undocumented and immigrant and young folks of color, why aren't they getting support services in the most traumatic period of their lives? Why aren't you bringing in their parents and asking them how can they do homework with their children when they don't even know if they're allowed to drop off their children? Right? Like, why aren't we actually having concrete conversations around what access actually looks like and not just simply making policies? Right? And so we kind of go one by one to every single school that we encounter and ask these same concrete, rational, I think, hopefully you do too, um, questions around why these things aren't actually happening if we say we value them. And then we kind of go to the young folks, and that's where kind of leadership development comes in. And we go to those young people, and we say, what do you want, right? Like, your family is being directly impacted by this. Your parents might not be there when you get home today, right? And we've actually seen that happen in LA, in New York City, outside of Seattle, inside of Seattle. Like, this is happening to people where their parents literally disappear when they get home. Can you imagine? for your family not to be there when you get home. I can't. I can't even fathom how you can work, play, and go to school, right? Oftentimes, like, government, I remember people like, this contract applies if you work, play, live, or worship there, <laughs> right? Like, that whole thing that we oftentimes do in, like, you know, spaces, right? Like, how can you do it? And so I say that only to say that that's really been a lot of our work. And then we say, young folks, like, what role do you actually want to play in that, right? Like, how do you want that work to be shaped? And so we work with high school students and college students concretely on the campuses of University of Washington, at Pacific Lutheran University, at University of Puget Sound Sage, working with young folks, immigrant and non-immigrant, who are building power on their campuses and shifting policy on their campuses to reflect what they believe. Because the statement from folks at the top is great, but a statement that matches the grassroots in the top is better. Um, and so we do that in very concrete ways because we know that if the voice of the folks most impacted gets matched, that real change actually occurs and that folks actually feel as if they've been heard. Um, and kind of what you can do to help going forward um, is actually how this story started. Um, I oftentimes always inspired by the folks that care and Anila because of how concrete they are, call the letter to the editor. And so I kind of borrowed that language and want to fully acknowledge that it's always inspiring to hear it concretely. All of you live or work next to a school. You do, right? And there's work being done already to sign folks up to, for petitions and things like that. The most powerful thing you can do, I mean this, is send an email to a principal, not as an activist. I don't need you to be your activist. We'll try to figure that out, but we'll ask you to support the work through donations and otherwise. But just as a, just someone who lives in a house, someone who lives in an apartment, and send an email to a principal, send an email to a teacher, send an email to someone who interacts with young folks at scale, 20 or more, all the time, and tell them that you're concerned, you know? Because we had to send an email ourselves to the principal of our school and say, look, you got a lot of kids of varying colors, and you've never said out loud that there's a problem that recently occurred. In Renton, right? Because the principal hadn't. They hadn't said it out loud. And you got to, right? Because the kids see it. They feel it. Kids aren't, you know, when bad news comes, kids know, right? All of a sudden, they're quiet, and they stop playing. You're like, what's going on? This is strange. You're not being a kid, right? But so we had to send an email. My wife and I had to literally send an email to our principal and say, look, like our kids, 
it matters to their classmates, right? My son, I remember when he, his best friend Seek, and he was just like, you know, what is that on his head? And like all these questions, right? And he wanted to understand, he wanted to make sure. And I said, not my best friend, but the kids in my kids' classroom, it matters to me that you say out loud, that your teachers say out loud, when we know that the majority of teachers are not teachers of color, that those teachers say with their words out loud that it matters and what is impacting students in their classroom matters. Because over 50% of public school students are students of color, over 90% of students are not teachers of color, right? And so when you see folks who don't look like you, don't say out loud that they care, it actually promotes bullying, violence, hate speech, and attacks. And the last thing I'll say about that is also to remember the issues and to understand the issue robustly. So black folks, and black folks who are immigrants are four times more likely to be deported. My parents are actually from the country of Haiti, which is one of the award winners around being deported from the United States, generally speaking. And I say that because when we think about migration, we often don't think, think about race, right? But race is a very key element in how de deportations occur. Um, the day of the election, it was mainly black folks who were deported on the spot. On the spot, they were deported, right? There were planes coming in, and they said, go back, <laughs> right? Immediately. And I think that's just important to say. So as you learn more about the issue, if you would like more information, we're more than happy to funnel it to the department, um, just so that you folks can learn more about the issue and so that you can also support the work and support the work of organizations. And the last thing I'll say about that, because I really appreciate the funding that King County has created and made, is that funding is complicated for organizations, especially community-based organizations, and there is no magical nonprofit that is gonna solve all our problems, and that's what, some of the thing that I've try, been trying to say out loud to a lot of folks. No magical nonprofit will solve it for us. So whether you've been inspired by me or any of all of us, like, it won't be one of us alone, right? It will actually be a series of folks, each of you taking concrete action, each of us taking concrete action to make a difference. And I say that out loud because sometimes the media likes to portray a flavor of the week or a flavor of the day, and they oftentimes don't talk about how hard this work is, how difficult it is, and I actually need every single person on this panel to continue to do their work so I don't die of exhaustion, right? And they need me to continue to do my work so they don't die of exhaustion, right? Because this is oftentimes labor that isn't funded concretely and in very reasonable revenue-driven ways. And, and if we don't kind of think about that when we think about labor and immigration and refugees, we can oftentimes put ourselves in a trap where we actually think it's gonna be one entity. If folks are just like, King County will solve all our problems, but not the federal government and not the city, you folks would be annoyed, right? <laughs> and so it's oftentimes the same thing for nonprofits. And so I oftentimes recommend that government folks kind of think about that analogy um, because I know how annoying it is for y'all. So I hope this serves, thank you.